right, I'm gonna skip some slides here since Tim opened this up. And I'd just like to open up by saying, I'm attacking an API right now. So let me, let me let that sink in, think about that. I'm attacking an API right now. And what am I doing? I'm standing up here, hands free, looking at all of you. And so that's really cool. But what we have to think about is hackers do the same thing. Hackers are constantly changing their landscape. They're using artificial intelligence and machine learning, just like we are. But it's okay, because I'm also detecting and blocking attacks on an API right now, also hands-free looking at all of you. So what we're going to talk about tonight is MuleSoft API lifecycle and API management. These are kind of the two stepping stones to actually get to securing an API. So we're gonna get through a little bit of how-to. Yep. Uh, we're gonna go through a little bit of how-to with API lifecycle and API management and then get into securing a MuleSoft API and just have some fun by attacking a MuleSoft API in a couple of different ways um, while I have this script running also. And then we're gonna get into ping intelligence with MuleSoft APIs and how that actually integrates with MuleSoft APIs. And Tyler's gonna talk about the complementary nature of, of ping intelligence and how we get maximum security out of the combination of ping intelligence with MuleSoft APIs. Uh, so API lifecycle. We're going to talk about the five pillars of the API lifecycle. Um, first one being design. Um, with MuleSoft, your design is going to come in Design Center. You're going to be building out your RAML and your nice API definition. You know, be sure to follow API best practices here. We're not going to get too deep down this path, um, but you know, be sure to use the correct methods here to get posts, put in deletes. Um, think resource first. Uh, think about your verbs and nouns. And this will happen in Design Center. And once you build out that nice API definition, you can publish that to Exchange, which starts your, your build phase at that point. So anyone from your organization at that point can use that same API that you created, or you can use that same API in the build phase here. And in your build phase, you're actually giving life to your API, right? So you're building flows around your API definition. Uh, you build that RAML first so that you don't have to come back later and redo it. I've seen a whole lot of APIs, and, and I've been guilty of this myself, where you just want to stand something up very quickly, just create an HTTP listener with MuleSoft, and you have no API definition around it, and you find yourself down the road reverse engineering something that just takes a lot of time down the road. So these are in order. Go through design, and then your build. Give life to your flows in that build phase. This will happen in Endpoint Studio. And with any good project lifecycle, you have a nice QA phase. Of course, this is your testing phase. Go through M unit tests, your, your regression tests, whatever your organization's standards are. And then that would bring you to the deployment phase once you go through QA successfully. Deployment would happen in Runtime Manager if you're deploying to Cloud Hub, and we'll take a look at that. And once you get through all four of these pillars, then you can start to manage and secure your API. We'll talk about management in just a little bit. So I'm gonna run through a little bit of that how-to with the API lifecycle. And we're gonna start here in Design Center. We're just gonna take a little, little look at RAML here. And what we've set up, if any of you, I see some, some new faces here and some old faces. Uh, if any of you were at the last meetup, you'll be familiar with the Pokemon API. So we're kind of reusing that and we enhance that. If you're not familiar with Pokemon, it's kind of like a, an anime thing where you know, these, these things attack each other. Um, but we're getting Pokemon details. You can see here on the right, where we have three Git endpoints. Uh, these are logging at different levels. We're getting Pokemon details about just different Pokemon here. You can see that we have a URI parameter for the Pokemon name. So just a really, really simple API with some Git endpoints, where it's basically a read-only API that sits in front of the database. All kinds. All kinds. You can get any anything from anything you can think of. <laughs> Throw something out later, please, because I'm, I'm at like Pikachu, Charizard, and <laughs> okay, uh, so once we're done with Design Center, once you're done building out your API definition, you can publish to Exchange. Makes that very easy. It makes it available to your entire organization. You can start to build around that API definition. And let's just take a quick look at that API in Exchange. It's going to be our Pokey API here. And we can see the same definition here on the left. If I was using best practice, I would probably have some documentation here about this API. And we have some versioning here on the right. So I've, I've deployed this nine different times. Um, you can also download this, you can edit it straight from here. Um, you can also use a mocking service if you choose to do that. I'm gonna get into the build phase though, and just talk quickly about our application. So what I did in our build phase was 
kind of took that Pokemon API that I had last time and I restructured it. I created some RAML around it. And then I got that into AnyPoint Studio and used the API kit to build some flows around that. So I scaffolded out some flows with API kit router here. You can see that all the endpoints are listed down here and they all call just about the same subflow. So coming into, into these flows here, flows that we're going to invoke from our HTTP listeners are here, where again, we're just logging at different levels, but they're basically doing the same thing. So don't worry about the nuances between any of these flows. They all call this subflow here, get Pokemon details, where we have another API. This is Mule 3, obviously. Um, we have another API built in Mule 4 that sits in front of a database. And the way we've enhanced the Pokemon API that we were calling out to last time is we put an API in front of that database to make our SQL injection tax that we're gonna see in a second just a little bit more real. So we're gonna call out to our database um, API, uh, our API that sits in front of the database, see if we have the Pokemon details in that database. And if we do, we're gonna return the response to the client. And if we don't, we're gonna call out to this public Pokemon API. We're going to get some Pokemon details. We get Pokemon abilities. And then at the very end, what we've done with that API that we've built in Mule 4 is we have the get endpoint to get Pokemon details and we have a post endpoint to actually insert Pokemon details so that we can stop going out to that public API and just use our own, especially because we're, we're running some attacks on these APIs. So we don't want to you know, raise any eyebrows with uh, this public Pokemon API or bring it down. And then we return the response back to the client. The only other thing I'll mention in the build phase here that will come into play later is API auto discovery. So for anyone looking to manage your API, this is a key piece where you can hook up your application to API manager and start to secure and manage your API. So this API auto discovery hooks this up to API manager where you can create a connection from your application to API manager. You send it statistics and it's a two-way connection API manager. Then when you have security policies on your API, we'll send um, run the, what's, what's running in runtime manager, which we'll look at in a second policies to actually secure your API. So let's assume that I've already been through a testing phase. I have, um, we've already deployed this to Runtime Manager. So let's take a look at Runtime Manager for our deployment phase. All right, and we see our two applications here. We'll start with the, the Pokey API that we called this. And we can see that we have running application here. We're in the deployment phase. We're running on 3.9.3. Great, we've deployed our zip file up here. Deployment has been successful. Uh, this would be our Mule 4 application. It's clearly pretty active. Uh, we're getting and inserting Pokemon details into our database in this API. And we're in MuleSoft version 4.2.0 here. So we have the two working together and we're all in the cloud. So I'm gonna get a little bit more into API management here. And flip back to the presentation. Before I do that, we're going to do first giveaway. I'm hoping you won't. Great, doesn't show the question. So anyone who wants to answer, you get a free training voucher, which is pretty cool. It's um, from my life, I know you're interested in that. Uh, any training that you want. So does anyone know the difference between rate limiting and request throttling as it pertains to MuleSoft API management security policies? You both are close, and we're giving away a water bottle. I can, but you, or Shankar, you probably already have a water bottle, right? From Big Compass. <laughs> yeah. So here you go. I'm not going to throw it out this time like I did last time, but you can claim your prize and get a free uh, training there. So what the what the difference is is with rate limiting, it's a hard limit. So you can specify two requests per second, and after two requests per second, you're going to get denial. You're going to get a, I believe it's a 403. Um, or I believe it's actually 429. Uh, and with request throttling, what's going to happen is just going to slow down your request. So it queues those up in the background and you can send in more than two requests per second, but it's just going to slow down those extra requests that are coming in past two requests per second. Is there one that's used for denial of Yeah, so rate limiting would be more for a, a you know denial of service type of attack, right? Where you're just going to cut somebody off. Um, you're getting extreme application activity and extreme requests in your API. 
yeah, you would just cut them off at that point. Whereas throttling would be, let's say you have a downstream system that can't handle so many requests, you could throttle those to you know, not hammer the downstream system. Okay, so API manager. This would be your management lifecycle, that, that fifth pillar of, of um, the API lifecycle. So creating an API, an API manager, they make it very easy. You can connect your API and API manager to an already running application, or you can deploy a proxy that would sit in front of your application. There's use cases for both. Uh, SLA tiers, we, we kind of talked about this with rate limiting request throttling, where you can specify a number of requests per time period, and you can do that at different tiers. So a lot of people that, that I've seen use this set it up at you know, bronze, silver, gold, platinum tier. And then customers can pay you know, a little bit extra to, to get to that platinum tier, for example. And contracts actually help enforce those SLA tiers. Contracts will enable those the request throttling limits, request or throttling limits um, per client. So you hand out client keys when clients request access to your API, and then you associate each one of those with a contract at a specific SLA tier. You can set up alerts on your API, and these can be really useful. They've, they've saved us before. So you're ultimately trying to go from a reactive process to a proactive process where you don't want to let something just happen and you don't know about it. So these alerts um, can be really great. Let's say you get latency that uh, is, is greater than five seconds, or you get a 429 response, for example. You can set up alerts for both of those. And then policies. There's out-of-the-box policies as well as custom policies that you can develop. Neosoft provides some really great out-of-the-box policies. Uh, the first custom policy I've actually developed was, was for this meetup. It's for Ping Intelligence, which we'll talk about in a second. And these provide the actual security on your API. And I'd be remiss if I, I didn't throw out the recommendation to just secure your APIs. There's really no excuse anymore. MuleSoft makes it so easy, and so do these other technologies. to Just secure your API so it's not open to the world. Even the most basic of security will help. So there's bots trolling the internet these days where you, know, you can get a malicious attack on, on an API that's open to the world. So secure your APIs even with uh, the most basic of security. And we're gonna recommend beyond that, but get to securing your APIs. And then monitoring. You can monitor the number of requests over time. You can monitor where in the world requests are coming from. And there's a few other monitoring tools that NoSoft provides for you. And so to dig a little bit more into policies before we get to actually attacking an API, Policies are used to actually secure your API, as I said, and they're specific to one API, although MuleSoft has a relatively new feature called automated policies. That's basically a reusable set of policies that you can use on many APIs. And so it's just some common policies that you can use to secure your API here with API managers, basic authentication, and OAuth 2.0, and IP whitelisting, and blacklisting. And there's a few here that are really, really useful for helping to protect at the basic level for your API. And then you get your SLA based rate limiting bottom, which we just talked about. So I'm going to demo the functionality of our API and send our first attacks to the API. Okay. And what we're going to do here is just display the functionality. Do you want to throw out a Pokemon name? You too. What is it? How do I spell that? Like that? Awesome. So Mewtwo did work. What does Mewtwo do? Opposing Pokemon cannot eat held berries while this Pokemon is in battle. Really useful, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we can do Pikachu. This is my default. We're just displaying the functionality of the API, right? So we're, we're getting Pokemon details through this endpoint here. And so what we can start to see now is that we have client ID and client secret that we're passing to this API. I'm gonna go ahead and mess up the client ID to make sure that that policy is working. Great, it is. I'm gonna mess up the client secret. Okay, it's asking for a valid client ID and client secret. We're also passing it just basic authentication here just to give you the various options. Test two doesn't work. Okay, we're starting to enforce some security here on API and mess up the password, same thing. Great, so I'm going to get past this initial layer of security here. If I pull up this request here, what we can see is that I'm going to send a SQL injection attack to this API and it's fully authenticated. I'm providing that client ID and client secret. 
providing that username and password. But what this would mock is somebody trying to get more information out of your API than what you had intended. And so what we can see is that the SQL injection tag goes right through those security policies. We can see the same thing here for a cross-site scripting attack, where this would mock somebody who's developed a script trying to execute that on your server. Maybe they've gotten information about your server and they know what the vulnerability would be. They've developed a script and trying to exploit your server or even bring your server down. Also gets right through the new soft security policies. So interesting, we're kind of looking at those next level attacks where we're kind of considering the basic authentication and client ID and client secret level one. These are kind of be those, those level two type of attacks. So we have to step up our security at the same time too. And really quick, I'm just going to show those policies that we have in API Manager that we're protecting our API. And so we have the Pokey API here. And I've created just one alert here. If my latency gets higher than five seconds, I'm going to get an alert to my email address. We've set up a couple of contracts here for the client ID that I was using. That client ID is at the silver SLA tier, which if I go to my policies here, we're going to see, sorry, my SLA tiers here. We're going to see that that silver SLA tier lets us send in 25 requests per second. Whereas the free one, I believe we set that at, at one request per second. So you can see how you can start to separate out clients based on maybe what they pay, maybe the functionality that you want to give them, maybe what's even downstream of your API. And then the most important thing here is the policies. So we see five different policies on this API. We see the rate limiting. So if I was going to send more than 25 requests per second to the API, we would have a hard cutoff where you start getting error responses back from the API. We have JSON threat protection. JSON threat protection is if you have any malicious content in JSON, it'll protect from that. You have the simple security manager and the HTTP basic authentication. These work hand in hand to give us that username and password authentication that we saw. And then finally, we have a custom policy here, the ping intelligence policy, and, and I'll let Tyler introduce that in just a second. Um, but this, this custom ping intelligence policy is how you integrate your MuleSoft API with ping intelligence. And Let's step up our level of not only attacks, but security. And we're gonna talk about MuleSoft Anypoint security here. MuleSoft Anypoint security is really great to secure many applications that are deployed in your runtime fabric. And these will be edge policies that sit on the edge of your network, protecting all the requests coming into your network. So your applications can actually sit behind something that may never even get hit if you send a SQL injection back to it, for example. So it sits at the edge of your network, protecting everything that's sitting behind it. You can set up a web application firewall, and we'll talk about what that does in just a second. You can set up IP whitelisting and denial of service protection and, and some of those HTTP limits. So what does MuleSoft plus WAF security actually give you with that web application firewall? It gives you some of the OWASP top 10 attacks protection. If you don't know what OWASP top 10 attacks is, is it's 10 of the most common attacks that, that have been identified. They're the known knowns from this community. It, protect, it protects, for example, against SQL injection and cross-site scripting and body scanning and, and these known vulnerabilities. And I really want to stress that point that these are known vulnerabilities. And I go back to my point that I made at the beginning of this presentation where hackers are using artificial intelligence and machine learning. They're going to attack you in a different way every single time. So they might spin up an attack on one IP address, attack you in one way. They're gonna get blocked there maybe. And then their, their artificial intelligence or machine learning is going to use a different IP address and attack you in a different way until they can finally get through on the API. So these are the known vulnerabilities. Even hackers don't know what they're going to attack you with. And so security policies plus WAF protection actually gets you those OWASP top 10 attacks, uh, protection from those OWASP top 10 attacks. The vulnerabilities are more advanced attacks. We're, we're starting to step up to our, our sort of level three layer of, of attacks. They're advanced API attacks from authenticated users. So we take some of the big companies in the world, right? Facebook, who had an authenticated attack where they got into their API and were exploiting information from their API by flying under all denial of service protection. They're flying under the radar there where nobody detected that for over a year in Facebook's organization. And so how do we actually protect against those vulnerabilities? Well, we have the answer to that, but we're, we're gonna hold that out for just a little bit longer. 
<clears throat> and to get into the architecture of, of this setup here, what we have here on the right is an application load balancer that we've set up that's open to the world. So I can hit that application load balancer. Hackers can hit that application load balancer. That application load balancer is protected by AWS Web Application Firewall. We didn't want to dive down the, the runtime fabric hole here, so we, we uh, uh, kept it with AWS. Um, so our application load balancer is open to the world, protected by Web Application Firewall, protecting against some of those SQL injection attacks and cross-site scripting. Then behind that, we have an Nginx proxy that's deployed on an EC2 instance that just forwards requests onto our MuleSoft Pokemon API. And what we see here is this is kind of what's known as, in, in many circles, the standard of, of API security here, where we have our application co completely quarantined off so that nobody can hit it besides the Nginx proxy. It's, it's completely isolated. The only thing that they can hit is what's open to the world, in this case, our application load balancer that's protected by our web application firewall, or so we think. And so I'm going to demo this. And I wanna just quickly look at kinda, and this would be the same with, with runtime fabric where you can set up rules on your web application firewall. We have some of these rules looking for SQL injection and cross-site scripting and rate limiting and so forth. And what you get there is a little bit of monitoring capabilities as well, where you can start to see requests that have come through and, and rules that are being violated on your web application firewall. But let's get to the fun stuff. So I'm going to hit our load balancer. So you can see here that my host name has changed. We're hitting this Nginx proxy load balancer is what I've called that. Again, it's open to the world. I'm going to request Charizard here. So we're gonna see the same functionality. We're gonna see the, the user and password authentication and the client ID enforcement. You know, if I mess up client ID here again, we're gonna see, okay, MuleSoft is doing its job. But let's step up our level of attack to SQL injection, hitting our load balancer. And what we're going to see here is that if I, whether I send this in a query parameter, in the body doesn't matter, we're going to get 403 forbidden here because our web application firewall is not even letting that get to our application. So our web application firewall is, is doing its job. It's protecting some against some of these OWASP top 10 attacks. Cross-site scripting, same thing. We're gonna see 403 forbidden here. And then what you'd be able to see on that back end from the web application firewall point of view is that I got some attacks on this API. But let's step up our attack game just a little bit. And now we would be mocking somebody who has authenticated access to your API and using a script to loop through a bunch of different users and just try to get information for really any different type of user. So they know that your API is out there. They know that there's information to get. They've gotten access to your API. So what we've mocked here is just a bunch of different user email addresses. None of these are sensitive. And so this would lead to potentially even like an API takeover attack where they could try to level up. They have access with one set of permissions. Maybe they get information from another user. Okay, they find another hole with that user. They can start to step up the ladder leading potentially to an API takeover attack. And at the very least, they start to get information, sensitive information on users. And so I can send this to the Nginx proxy. And what this does is with Postman, you can see here in the URI parameter, we have this variable here, and we have the filter query parameter here, where we're looping through this set of users, and we're sending those requests through our load balancer and through our web application firewall. And so we get 404 mapped as failure because it's not a valid Pokemon name, but you can see here that we got a 200 status okay. So this actually hit our application, and if I keep sending these, it'll just keep moving through that user list, trying to get information from different types of users. That will conclude this demo. And what I'm going to do is pass this over to Tyler to start to introduce the next level of security. Thanks, Aaron. Hey, everyone. So another giveaway. Favorite part of the meetup, right? Oh, just clicked once. How long did it take Google to detect their ongoing breach, which was announced last year? I'm gonna wait for the answers to come up here. All right, so that would be D. <laughs> Two and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about Facebook? Um, does anyone remember how long it took Facebook? 
it was about, I think it was 16, 16 months or something like that. Yeah. Um, so quite a, quite a lengthy time between um, the vulnerability and, and the breach in time from, from, from that time to inception of detection. So the, the API train is left, right? I mean, when you think of buzzwords out there, you know, digital transformation around APIs is about as omnipresent as it gets. Um, and if you look at the, the growth of APIs, it's, it's quite spectacular. Um, and when you think about it, almost all future value you're going to be providing your customers and partners is going to be routed through APIs um, in some form or another. And I always joke, I said, you know who's equally as excited about these digital transformation initiatives around APIs? It's, it's hackers. Um, and I'm, I'm in the InfoSec world, and so I go to a lot of InfoSec conferences, and you'll see white hats there and some gray hats. And oftentimes you'll hear a lot of these scary dudes refer to APIs as digital buffets. And they, they laugh when they, when, 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 when they talk to the, amongst themselves because they, they view these as really the a new tack vector on the enterprise. So 2018 was not a great year if you were an InfoSec professional or API practitioner tasked with protecting API infra infrastructures and the digital assets that those API infrastructures protect. Um, we saw a massive increase in not only the velocity of attacks on APIs, but also the sophistication of those attacks. And when you do a post-mortem, um, you actually find a few different things in common. So one, the majority of attacks are either coming from authenticated users or hackers who have reverse engineered the API itself. Um, and that the average time to detection is quite staggering. So as we mentioned before, Google was over two years, Facebook over a year. Um, in the case of Location Smart, which was a B2B API that all the major telcos were using, um, it was a lengthy amount of time as well. And it actually, it was, a, it was Location Smart and then a group of nefarious actors who had reverse engineered the API to be able to actually identify the location of every single user. And this was a vulnerability every single major telco here in the States was susceptible to. Um, and what we want to do is we want to figure out how we can be Rather than more reactive, we can be proactive in addressing some of these more advanced attacks on your APIs today. And so that's what we're here to talk about. And I'm so I, I didn't really get to introduce myself too much, but I'm a startup guy. I've been a number of these early stage startups. The last one um, was a small company, and we had spent a little over three years in stealth thinking about API security um, in context to a lot of these advanced attacks coming from authenticated users. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So API security is not trivial, right? This is tough and nuanced. And when you think about it, it's almost the perfect dichotomy because as InfoSec professionals, we're tasked every day um, with protecting our organization's data systems and applications. When you think about digital transformation initiatives powered by APIs, it's exactly the opposite, right? We're exploring new revenue streams. We're opening up data and our digital assets and systems to an array of new partners as well as our customers. So once you digest that fact, you begin to understand some of the cruxes and nuances to protecting these darn things. And it really is a true data problem, a true big data problem, right? Um, with credential theft on the rise, you're really trying to make sense of all this traffic and trying to find a needle in a haystack. So vulnerabilities on APIs today. So Aaron did, I think, a great job of kind of laying out the foundational API security. So the vendor community, MuleSoft, all of the big SIs, the boutique SIs tasked with deploying these API infrastructures have a list of those best practices around rules, policies, rate limiting um, uh, for each API. Um, the, the kinds of attacks that I think are a little bit scarier and oftentimes go undetected really fall into two, three different categories. So you have API login and DDoS attacks. So these are non-volumetric DDoS attacks that are meant to flow below the rate limits set by an API gateway. You have hackers who are stealing API keys, tokens, and cookies and looking like normal users. Um, and then you have a compromised account and insider attacks. So I call these typically the worst case scenario attacks. And they're attacks that are coming from authenticated users or a hacker who has reverse engineered your API. And as Aaron mentioned before as well, hackers are deploying a set of tools and their own machine learning um, tool set to perpetually change the attack pattern. 
were working with a large airline out of Europe and they, um, they realized every single time they blocked an attack from this botnet, it perpetually changed the attack pattern or figure out where the rate limits were set and then began attacking their APIs again. So they actually deployed their own set of fake APIs for the bot to ingest, which I'll get into here in a little bit. Deception is one of my favorite subjects. So can machine learning help? Um, yes, for, for sure. Um, and when you think about it, you're already collecting all of this data, right? Any, when anytime you hear machine learning or neural networks, you need to feed it lots of data for it to become useful. And the data you have already, it's all of the request response traffic, it's the headers, it's the footers, it's all of the metadata associated with the payload and those APIs um, and, that, and that API call. So if you can model and understand what is normal behavior on the API, it gives you the unique ability to not only identify outright attacks, but the nuance around misuse and abuse on each individual API. And then actually gives you the ability to be able to work with the MuleSoft gateway to block these kinds of attacks. So we spent a little over three years in stealth as a startup building our own machine learning engine from scratch to do just this. So ping intelligence for APIs. Um, this is one of the reasons you guys are all here today. Um, what is this ping intelligence for APIs? Um, well, really it provides three things. So firstly, it gives you deep visibility. And I mean visibility from two different perspectives. So one, visibility to where all of your APIs are, right? There's APIs out there that are either forgotten about, left active for backwards compatibility. Maybe you have multiple API gateways or you have APIs deployed on application servers and you don't know about where all those APIs are. So we can give you visibility into that. Secondly, it's visibility into what's happening after authentication has occurred. Um, and that gives you the ability to identify a wealth of different nuanced API misuse and abuse, advanced attacks, API takeover, data theft on an API, um, and then actually gives you the ability to integrate with the MuleSoft runtime to block these attacks on a number of different client identifiers. So today we can block attacks on IP address, token, cookie, API key, and then the next release coming out in a few months, we'll actually be able to extract the client identifier from the token and do reporting and blocking on a user identifier level as well. Almost every aspect of our software is self-learned, self-configured. Gone are the days of creating individual rules and policies for each API. So as your API ecosystem changes, as the application of those APIs are interfacing with changes, we're gonna shift and create a stronger model to understand what is normal behavior. So anyone familiar with the concept of zero trust? I know we don't have a whole lot of InfoSec professionals in this room. Basically zero trust is to make the assumption that, well, zero trust is not to trust anyone, whether it's an authenticated user, an employee, a partner, whoever it is, right? This is kind of the, the last iteration of defense in depth in the security world. And when you think about it as an identity company ping, right, we say trust the Barrick token. All the identity companies and the API companies are saying that. But what we've realized is that you can't necessarily trust the Barrick token. Well, you can, but you want to verify. And so you could think of ping intelligence for APIs as the first iteration of zero trust to protect your collective API infrastructure. Because what we're doing is we're making the assumption that any connection at any time could turn malicious at a moment's notice. We don't care if the user is an insider or somebody in your trusted B2B partner API ecosystem or a consultant um, or a hacker who's reverse engineered the API or hijacked an OAuth token. We're making the assumption that any connection at any time could be malicious. And by doing that, you're able to incorporate a zero trust strategy to protect your digital transformation initiatives around APIs. So MuleSoft plus ping. Well, we were partnering together with MuleSoft for a number of reasons, but you know, firstly is for this better together story to be able to help you guys not only enable all of these digital transformation initiatives around APIs and sleep better at night, but also to provide you a deep visibility and cyber attack protection. So MuleSoft provides a, a, a killer, you know, slot of this foundational security. So from content injection to flow control and the, the, the quota throttling and access control to where MuleSoft, sorry, Ping Intelligence is gonna provide you that next layer of cyber attack protection and the deep visibility. 
So attacks from um, automated attacks from authenticated users. We have some pretty slick tech around deception, which I'll dive into here in a little bit. And then the deep API traffic and visibility for full audit trails and forensics reports on each API. So we spoke a little bit about web application firewalls and um, API gateways, of course, with MuleSoft today and Ping Intelligence. And it's really the combination of these three different groups of products, which are gonna give you complete visibility and protection across your entire API infrastructure. The web application firewall is gonna go after those known vulnerabilities, the OWASP top 10. Um, your API gateway is gonna have individual rules and policies you can build for each API, and then be able to provide uh, rate limiting and client throttling for each API. And ping intelligence for APIs is the last layer of defense to provide not only zero trust, but attack detection from some of these more authenticated attacks. Um, from, sorry, attack detection from authenticated users and advanced attacks. So deception, um, is anyone here familiar with the MMA discipline of judo? So judo is all about leveraging your opponent's strengths against them. Um, and deception, of course, is not new to the, the cybersecurity world. It's been around for decades, but no one had really applied it to APIs before. And we realized that we're actually have visibility into all the URLs that hackers are trying with our engine. And what we can do is create fake APIs and sprinkle them throughout your API infrastructure. Um, you could think of these as like a dynamic honeypot. So you can actually program these fake APIs inside of real APIs as a separate hash. If a hacker touches one of these AP fake APIs, we instantly identify the source, we capture the hacker, and then we report back to the MuleSoft runtime to block and prevent connection to any real APIs. And we're actually giving you some visibility into what that hacker was trying to do, capturing a little bit of the attack pattern as well. So you could think of this deception piece, this honeypot piece, as the more proactive way to, to go after and gain visibility into hackers who are probing your environment. Um, the machine learning and AI engine is the zero trust piece to be able to identify some of these more advanced attacks or attacks and abuse that are coming from authenticated users. Um, so to summarize, right, API breaches are going undetected for years and months. And when you talk to a lot of the, the boutique, um, you know, SIs and, you know, pen testing companies, I mean, they'll tell you most API attacks today go undetected. Um, enterprises really do need to incorporate this zero trust, po zero trust posture for their collective API strategy. And we have support from Gartner saying, you know, by 2022, every single year, um, increases in both the sophistication and velocity and number of attacks that result in data theft are gonna go up and it's gonna hit a max at 2022. But this is why we're partnering with MuleSoft to be able to protect you from this. So that's it for my slides. Any other questions before we uh, go back to attacking APIs? No? Okay, back to you Martin. So we'll get into some technical aspects of the installation that will hopefully answer some more questions here also. So this diagram is going to look very similar. So this will look very similar, of course. So the only thing that's changed here is the actual addition of Ping Intelligence. Um, so you can see how, <laughs> you see how Ping Intelligence is supplementary to all of these components of our architecture here. And so what we have again is our application load balancer completely open to the world, protected by web application firewall. Hackers or clients can hit that. Behind that, an Nginx proxy on EC2. Behind that are completely isolated MuleSoft Pokemon API. And then integrated with that now is Ping Intelligence. And so a little bit more details there. To integrate Ping Intelligence with MuleSoft, what you wanna do is number one, create that custom policy that I showed earlier in the demo. And that's going to allow MuleSoft to talk to Ping Intelligence, but this is a, a two-way connection. So then you wanna install Ping Intelligence and you can install Ping Intelligence. I did this on a, a Linux EC2 instance. Um, Ping Intelligence can live anywhere in the cloud, on-prem, as long as they can communicate with your APIs. I think we got that question earlier. And so that's, that's the other connection there. Once you install Ping Intelligence, you're going to configure it to point to your API. And then you have the two-way connection where MuleSoft is sending requests out to Ping Intelligence. Ping Intelligence is gathering all that information, running its behavioral security model, 
and then blocking attacks on your API. Within Ping Intelligence, there's a couple components. There's actually three components. It has what's called ABS. Tyler talked a little bit about this. It's API behavioral security. And this is really the, the AI engine. It's, it's the crux of Ping Intelligence and how it works. So that's what's going to actually model your behavior. And it talks to something called ASE, which is API Security Enforcer. That's what's actually going to block the attacks. And it, it communicates with ABS there within there. And then the third component of Ping Intelligence is an actual dashboard. So users can come in and access the Kibana dashboard to view statistics on the API. So we'll get into a demo. Of how MuleSoft Security works with Web Application Firewall and Ping Intelligence. And I can't get out of presentation mode. Let's end the show. Okay, so I'm gonna show just a couple features of Ping Intelligence first. This is the dashboard that you're going to see as a Ping Intelligence user. And what you're going to see here is you're kind of right off the bat is that we're monitoring one API. And over the course of about the last week, I've gone through training, Heartland, as you mentioned, I sent about 100,000 requests to this API from many different IP addresses so it can learn normal what's normal behavior and then start to detect those attacks. So I've done this many, many, many times. I've sent 23 total attacks from seven different IP addresses here, and you can start to monitor those in your, in your Kibana dashboard. You can also set up alerts to go to email or Slack, and I believe Ping Intelligence is even working on a couple different types of alerts there. So what you see is that we're monitoring a REST API is what it's called here, sort of towards the bottom. This is living at our meetup demo project, Pokey API that I showed earlier. And like I said, it's communicating back and forth with that API. We can see the number of attacks that have occurred over time. And if we wanna get a little bit deeper, what Ping Intelligence provides is a RESTful API now to start to call and get more insight into what's actually happening within your API. So I'm going to call this get method on this attacks uh, endpoint here. And what we're going to see is Ping Intelligence is starting to monitor for many different types of attacks. Tyler mentioned data exfiltration. You're going to get the DDoS. It's going to actually detect SQL injection and stuff like that too, but it's not really meant for that. It's meant for the behavioral security, those anomalies. We get extreme app activity here, and you can see exactly what IP address that's coming from, what threshold it crossed in terms of the behavioral security model, and what time that occurred. A couple other cool things, those would be attacks. And somebody asked earlier what, what happens with false positives, right? So there's sort of a, a different level within Ping Intelligence is that it can detect anomalies. So I've sent some SQL injection attacks here and it's starting to notice those as anomalies. That's not normal behavior, but it wasn't enough to actually trigger an attack. It didn't actually start to block that traffic. And you can start to alert on anomalies. This would probably require manual intervention. Some of you come look at this and, and see what happened. Okay, was this an attack? Do we care about this? Do we not? And then finally, you can get some key metrics here. So this would be a breakdown per IP address, how many requests, what URL they were hitting, you know, what was the request coming into your, your API. And then finally, what we're going to see is the actual demo. So I, I mentioned at the beginning of this that I was attacking an API as I was standing here, right? And so all I did was kick off the Postman runner. It's looping through all of those users that I mentioned in the last demo. And it's trying to get, this would be mocking trying to get user information from an API and even possibly trying to do an API takeover. So what we have here is we've set up a test. This is not a 403. What we're looking for is a 403 to when ping intelligence actually kicks in and starts to block that attack. So it, we call this near real time. It's not totally real time. It's going to take a few minutes. The ABS engine has to actually detect it first. It's not just an anomaly. Okay, this is an actual attack and let's block that attack. So we see 200 okays, we see a bunch of these. And what we're going to see now is I had a latency, I believe of half a second in between each one of these requests. What we see after 145 iterations here is that we start to get 403 forbidden. And so I wasn't doing anything here. Ping Intelligence recognized this as an attack on the MuleSoft API and actively blocked that. It adds it to a blacklist internally. 
and you can modify that blacklist. You can even supply IP addresses to that blacklist. You can supply IP addresses to a whitelist, but very powerful stuff here where that ABS security starts to kick in and actually recognize this as an attack. We get 403 forbidden and, and I paused the attack here. That's it for our presentation. We have a bunch of references and documentation here. I'm happy to talk about the network, more about API manager and API security. Happy to talk about more of these attacks, um, logging, um, as well as more about ping intelligence, of course.